This trial by death, however, does away with the truth which was supposed to issue from it, and so too with the certainty of self generally. For just as life is the natural setting of consciousness, independence without absolute negativity, so death is the natural negation of consciousness, negation without independence, which thus remains without the required significance of recognition. Death certainly shows that each staked his life and held it of no account, both in himself and in the other, but that it is not for those who, who survive this struggle. They put an end to their consciousness in its alien setting of natural existence, that is to say, they put an end to themselves, and are done away with as extremes wanting to be for themselves or to have an existence of their own. But with this there vanishes from their interplay the essential moment of splitting into extremes with opposite characteristics, and the middle term collapses into a lifeless unity which is split into lifeless, merely immediate, unopposed extremes, and the two do not reciprocally give and receive one another back from each other consciously, but leave each other free only indifferently, like things. Their act is an abstract negation, not the negation coming from consciousness, which supersedes in such a way as to preserve and maintain what is superseded, and consequently survives its own supersession. We saw that Hegel has brought two self-consciousnesses in this entire section, self-consciousness, into a relation with each other, where both of them are attempting to not only possess self-certainty, be for themselves, as we said, but for themselves through an other, uh, who is also equally trying to be for himself or her herself. And they end up coming into a clash that Hegel has talked about as the battle or the struggle to the death. Now, in section 188 and in what precedes, we're seeing what the effects are of engaging in this struggle to the death. And some of them are what we might call um, social effects. We're looking at the relationship that develops between ultimately master and slave, or lord, lord and bondsman, boss and the person who's bossed around. We could go on and on. The one who power is uh, you know, imposed upon and the one who must do what power demands of it. But there's also uh, another dimension that's very important for the development of consciousness that he's talking about here. And in this paragraph, it primarily has to do with what happens to these consciousnesses when they risk their life. And risking their life means risking death. They literally place themselves in the face of death, where death is not just the cessation of life, but it's also the aggression of the other, which is a mirror of one's own aggression. So there's a lot going on in here. The question that we're asking then is what occurs in the struggle to the death? So he says that this trial by death does away with the truth which was supposed to issue from it. What is the truth that's supposed to issue from it? We saw that both consciousnesses possessed a kind of self-certainty which was instable. And the only way in which they could really maintain that self-certainty, in which they could have the truth of that self-certainty, a certainty on a higher level, was by making the other negate him or herself. Treating the other in a certain way as an object, but also as a subject. And, you know, the other doesn't want to do this. The other would like the other other to do this. And both of them come into a conflict. The ultimate way to try to do this is, as we saw just in, in the last paragraph before this, to place your own life on the line, to raise the stakes, you might say, not infinitely. Well, you could even say infinitely, since, since consciousness is, you know, infinitude. But to raise the stakes as high as they'll go to raise the stakes to the final possibility, the final penalty, death. So it didn't do what was expected. Something else happened as a result. The self-consciousness did not attain the truth that it was looking for. Neither one did. So why is this happening? It, it, it has to do with what's going on on both sides and their relation to these larger things of life and death. So he says, just as life is the natural setting, or the German is position, of, of consciousness, um, 
independence without absolute negativity. That's, that's what's going on with life. That's why life by itself, by the way, um, for Hegel, it's very interesting, it's very important, but life simply on its own is in a certain way meaningless. It, it doesn't have um, negativity going for it the way that, that we need. And every time that we see a recurrence to just, you know, the sphere of life or something like that, there's always something like a step backwards taking place. So life is the setting for, for self-consciousness, but we saw that self-consciousness is, well, it is something living, is something beyond mere life. Um, it introduces this absolute negativity into it. And what's the absolute negativity? Death. Death is not just merely the absence of life. Death is being understood here as something that requires a bit more thinking than just saying not, right, or end. Um, there's, there's something in, in, a, in effect anxiety-provoking or terrifying or puzzling about death and we, we don't just, you know, think about this abstractly. This is something that we all have to face sooner or later, uh, in, in part because we are living mortal beings, right? That's what it means. Mortal is you're going to die eventually. And not only are you going to die, everybody else around you is going to die as well. And everybody that we're reading about has themselves, you know, well, not everybody, though some are still living, but a lot of these philosophers, like Hegel himself, have, have died. So... What's going on? How does something survive that? Um, that's part of what we're, we're getting at. In any case, he says, death, unlike life, is the natural negation of consciousness. The natural negation. Um, consciousness is on the scene, and self-consciousness is engaged with self-consciousness long before anything like a theoretical exposition of it shows up, like Hegel's account here, or even the Hobbesian state of nature, which, by the way, this looks an awful lot like in many interesting respects that we can talk about in another uh, video. Um, so the natural negation of consciousness, it is a cessation, it is a, an annihilation, an ending of consciousness that makes it no longer conscious, makes it no longer be a consciousness there. So he says, negation without independence. That's part of the thing with death that makes it so puzzling. You can't really get your fingers around it like a thing. It's not a thing. It, it, it's not even, you could say, it's not even an experience as such, the way that another human being is, or recognition is, or, or even freedom is. Death is something different than that. So he goes on and he says, um, death... Um, is negation without independence, which thus remains without the required significance of recognition. What is he getting at here? If I'm in the struggle to the death with you, I'll make you the other self-consciousness, and I'm engaged in this clash, what I'm really after is recognition. That's what you're really after as well. If I kill you, I get a momentary, you know, superiority, but that superiority is not something lasting. Even if I set up a trophy, I killed so-and-so at this point, the way that, you know, ancient people did. Or you tell stories about how, you know, Greg Sadler slew the, the whoever you are, right? Um, it's not lasting because I don't have your self-consciousness there to recognize my superiority over you. You're gone. You've died. I can't get what I need from you. Likewise, if you kill me, you can't get what you desire, fundamentally, from me. So there is an interesting dynamic here. You want to push it up until death, but you don't want the people to die in it. If they do, then we just repeat the whole process all over again. You've got to find another self-consciousness to engage in a battle to the death with. We need some sort of other resolution. And that's what we're going to get to in the other, the other paragraphs. But let's see what, what he says here. He says, Death certainly shows each staked his life and held it of no account, both in himself and in the other. When I'm attacking the other, I'm you know, risking the fact that they might kill me, but I'm also risking the fact that I might destroy them and not get what I want from them, which is another self-consciousness within the framework that I want them. So I'm treating them as if they, 
you know, are, are something that is okay to throw into the, uh, the, the gamble, something that's okay to risk the destruction of, not something infinitely precious, uh, which it really is to me, because I really want that recognition. But I, I treat myself as, as something which is okay to risk the life of. I treat you as one who is in a similar condition. Um, I'll risk your life. You'll risk your life. You'll risk my life. That's how we can have a real fight. So he says, um, it's not for those who survive this struggle. They put an end to their consciousness in its alien setting of natural existence. N alien setting of natural existence is just life, right? Um, they have, have uh, put an end to themselves. They're done away as extremes wanting to be for themselves. When you're willing to risk death, you are in, in a certain way staking out a position towards yourself as saying, I can be treated as just a thing, because I'm going to treat myself as just a thing. So if that other guy over there treats me as just a thing, he's doing to me what I have already done to myself. Now, you might say, well, why should anyone do that? Well, if you don't do that, Hegel says, you treat yourself as something, in a certain way, less than a thing. You don't actually uh, bring about the possibilities you don't actualize the possibilities of what it means to be self-conscious. You don't act, and I'm going to say this in a very Lacanian way, you don't act upon your desire. You don't acknowledge your desire. Uh, your desire is ultimately for recognition, for that self-certainty that only comes from and through another self-conscious human being. All right, so he says, um, they're done away with as extremes wanting to be for themselves. With this, there vanishes uh, from their interplay the essential moment of splitting into extremes with opposite characteristics. They've been shown to be essentially the same, right? The middle term, whatever this middle term is, it's not recognition. It's actually the middle term of self-consciousness, you know, splitting into its two extremes. Or the middle term is the clash, the, the struggle itself. Um, that disappears. He says, um, the, the essential moment of splitting into extremes goes away. The middle term collapses into a lifeless unity, which is split into lifeless, merely immediate, unopposed extremes. These, these two self-consciousnesses, which now realize, like he says, um, the two do not reciprocally give and receive one another back from each other consciously. This recognition, this mutual recognition is not actually taking place. We thought that there might be a mutual recognition involved in the very fact that I'm willing to fight with you, the very fact I'm willing to struggle with you, shows that I treat you as, as serious, as a real contender, but I'm actually treating you as an indifferent freedom, he says, like a thing, a ding, you know, in, in the German. Not a zaka, not a matter, not a you know, sort of state of affairs, like a thing, like we might say this, this thing here. Um, you are doing the same to me. If we have two self-consciousnesses, they're doing the same thing. They're treating each other that way, and they're regarding themselves as such. So he says, their act is an abstract negation, not the negation coming from consciousness, which supersedes in such a way as to preserve and maintain what's superseded, and consequently survives its own supersession. Now, you know, why is all this superseding, supersession language important here? Remember, that's what self-consciousness was looking for in the other. It superseded the other that it saw as containing something like itself, and then it superseded that supersession as well. Uh, it, the entire time what it was looking for is the other to, you might say, give in or knuckle under or or negate itself as something that can choose to do so for the, the other self. It's not going to get that at this point quite yet. So the struggle to the death doesn't immediately produce what it was supposed to do, which, you know, big surprise, almost every human experience is like that, right? So this turns out to be like other human experiences, there's much more contained in it than we thought, and in a certain respect, there's also less. 
In this experience, self-consciousness learns that life is essential to it as pure self-consciousness. In immediate self-consciousness, the simple eye is absolute mediation and has as, as its essential moment lasting independence. The dissolution of that simple unity is the result of the first experience. Through this, there is posited a pure self-consciousness and a consciousness which is not purely for itself, but for another. That is, is a purely immediate consciousness or consciousness in the form of thinghood. Both moments are essential, since to begin with they are unequal and opposed, and their reflection into a unity has not yet been achieved. They exist as two opposed shapes of consciousness. One is the independent consciousness, whose essential nature is to be for itself. The other is the dependent consciousness, whose essential nature is simply to live or to be for another. The former is Lord, the other is Bondsman. In section 189, Hegel is now going to introduce to us these two terms or these two concepts that run throughout the rest of this, this part, that of master or lord, Herr, and servant, slave, bondsman, however you want to translate, connect. Uh, this is a relationship of power. It's a structural relationship, we could say, where one of the self-consciousnesses, one of the human beings, is in the power of the other. And we want to see how this ends up happening. He doesn't unfold all of this uh, dynamic for you, the origin of it, in this paragraph. Some of it he's going to reserve for the next paragraph and then a little bit of follow-up as we go throughout the rest of the section. But he is going to tell us something very important about this asymmetry that, that's occurring. And it occurs because of what happens in the struggle to the death. We saw that the two self-consciousnesses begin in a roughly equal position. So the question then is, how do they end up in this unequal position? So there's a lot packed into this little paragraph. Um, he says, in this experience, the Erfahrung, and, and remember, Erfahrung for Hegel has a, an important connotation much of the time that we're going to see it arising in the, the phenomenology, it's occurring when some sort of dynamic advance has taken place. Um, Self-consciousness or spirit or whatever we're going to talk about has a, an experience. It, it experiences something. It, it travels. It, it makes its way to somewhere else. It's carried along, you might say, into a new gestalt. And what we're talking about here is really a new shape of consciousness, or rather two new shapes of consciousness that are mutually interrelated. Um, so, self-consciousness has this experience, and self-consciousness is going to learn in that experience what is essential to it. This is actually a good point to make a sort of side note that is going to apply not only to the master-slave dialectic, but to um, much of what we're seeing occurring throughout the phenomenology, even the, the parts that we've already gone over with you know, sense, uh, sense certainty and perception, and forcing the understanding and the earlier parts of self-consciousness. Um, self-consciousness or, or spirit or the person, however you want to think about it, you and I, we, we learn things, we learn what is essential to us. The, the entire dialectical development is sort of a, a progress in, in trying to grasp on to what is, what is really essential. Sometimes we're grasping at something external to ourselves and as we manipulate it and handle it, we find that, oh, I thought that I had what was essential to it, and now I have to reach into it, the interiority of the object, or, you know, I have to look at how, how it's related to other things. The essence, I don't want it to say, that, you know, that it's something like a will-o'-the-wisp that we're never able to catch, but it's not as easy to grasp and to hold on to as if we were dealing with a static universe, a static conception of consciousness, a static conception of being. Now, a lot of the time, the essence is also within ourselves, and we want to appropriate that because, you know, for Hegel, there is a dynamic within consciousness itself, an individual consciousness, that wants to focus on 
ourselves and our lives and our penumbra, or penumbra I would be, uh, you know, these sort of, you know, uh, external shadowy areas that are not actually ourselves, but, but are yet at the same time ourselves, uh, that we, you know, our being pervades into, whether we think of it in terms of personal space or apparel or influence or anything like that. All of that can be understood in terms of what is essential. And so, uh, again, this is very much of a, a digression, but I think that this will be useful for you. Um, the narcissist is somebody who thinks that they are more essential than they really are and who is troubled deep down inside by a fear that perhaps they're not essential whatsoever, that they have to, you know, conceal from themselves and project out onto the world, hey, it's all about me. Um, the narcissist is incapable of dialectical development, Hegel would say, or at least, you know, any really meaningful dialectical development, because the relationship to the other is essentially precluded for them, or as Lacan would say, for, foreclosed. It, it's not a possibility. It's cut off by the way in which they uh, engage with things. So all of that said, self-consciousness is learning what it is, what is essential to it, and thereby what is essential to life and the universe as well, because it, it is centering things around itself. So what is essential to it? There's two things at this stage. Life. Life is essential to it. But life is not the only thing essential to it. This is where, you know, we have to be very uh, attentive to what's going on in the text. Very short, you know, um, section here. He says... Um, here we go. It learns that life is as essential to it as pure self-consciousness. Pure self-consciousness is also essential to it. The simple I that we've talked about, the I that is able to not be lost in the immediacy or the determinacy of life. I and more than just a guy who wears these glasses and dresses in this tie and is this tall. You know, you can't really see how tall I am because I'm not using a measuring thing. You know, it's almost like the kid who you ask, how tall are you? This tall. I'm six foot three, right? Um, 45 years old. I am not just those, those sum of qualities or characteristics or statistics or, or you know, notations on a, a form that can be predicated of me. Although those are what I am. I am not not those things, but that's not the totality. In order to be a human being capable of agency, we have to have this element or this moment of the simple I. This is something that a lot of philosophers in, indeed grasp. The capacity for abstraction is part of that. The capacity to negate to go beyond, to transcend. In Hegelian terms, to engage in sublation or aufhebung. Um, that is coming from the simple I, the you know, power of the negative that Hegel was talking about early on in the preface. Both of these are important. Life means that I am a determinate living being, which is in an environment of other determinate living beings, that I'm not reducible to some sort of schema, although I may be able to be schematized in the many systems that comprise my, my living corporeality, I am not just something that you could put into a textbook. I, I, I exist, I, I live, I continue, I consume, I you know, expand and contract. But beyond that, there is the, the simple I. That is what it really has independence. We, we understand independence through Hegel in two mutually connected ways. One way of being independent is just to exist as a thing, you know? This book, after I die, this book is probably still going to be around. And, you know, who knows, if I, if I become famous and I write, you know, marginalia and it'll wind up in some box, first of all, that some former student will have, and then a library will take it, and then some other, you know... Uh, graduate student who got a fellowship, or who knows who, uh, will be, you know, looking through it, I wonder, I wonder what he meant by that, you know. I, I'll be dead. 
my, my self-consciousness will not be on the scene. But this independent object will still exist, right? And even, let's say, everybody forgets to read English and we're, you know, in some, some you know, future time way down the line and the library has fallen into ruins and they come across this item here, um, they may not be able to understand it in terms of its linguistic reality, but they'll still be able to say, ah, oh, look at this, there's an object there. It has independence. It, it lasted beyond me. Um, you know, Hegel's phenomenology, if we want to think about it, not just in terms of this particular copy of the book, which I'm sure is not as old as I am, but in terms of the phenomenology itself, um, or think about a you know, piece of music, Mozart's, you know, whatever for, for whatever. Um, that pre-existed me. It has an independence. Yet it doesn't have the kind of independence that, that self-consciousness has. Self-consciousness has independence in part because it can affect a sort of agency of negativity, even towards itself. It can stake out negative positions. This is in part what, what you know, Sartre took over in Being a Nothingness and ran with for hundreds of pages, um, you know, also bringing in some, some Heidegger as well. But this is something that is really integral to Hegel's conception of, of self-consciousness. We're never going to get away from the simple eye, from the capacity to go beyond, to see limits and, and get beyond the limit and negate things. Um, that's part of what's going to be so difficult to capture. Uh, we have to sort of, sort of bring these together. So, uh, all that said, now we move over to, to this side, and he starts talking about um, the consequences for this. He says, the um, dissolution of that simple unity, what simple unity? Uh, of pure self-consciousness, is the result of the first experience. Through this there is posited a pure self-consciousness and a consciousness which is not purely for itself, but for another. That is, is it in a, a merely immediate consciousness or consciousness in the form of thinghood. So as consciousness is grappling with itself in the struggle to the death, something is going to emerge from that. One of the self-consciousnesses is going to turn out, as we're going to see a little bit later, to be shaken in its being and to give in. It's going to value life and its determinate existence more than it's going to value its, its existence as pure self-consciousness, but the other one is not going to. The other one is going to value its existence as that which can negate, can negate even itself, can throw itself entirely into the battle and the risk of its own death. It can be more human in a certain way, if this is indeed part of what it is to be human, and Hegel thinks it is, that's going to gain a different kind of consciousness. So the pure I, the pure self-consciousness, is on this side over here. The other side, we have a consciousness that, like he says, um, is not purely for itself. Right Now, he doesn't say that it's not for itself at all. I want to stress this point very strongly. It, it, to say that it's not purely for itself does not mean that it does not have a self-relation, does not have a conception of who it is. But it has a conception as being less important, as being subordinate, as being determined rather than determining, as not having the freedom that the pure I has. We can also think about this in sort of uh, linguistic terms. You know, Bakhtin, uh, who, who uh, is a very dialectical thinker and who is influenced to some degree by Hegel, remarks that in some um, contexts we can see who really matters by who is able to use that pronoun, I, and not just to be able to say the word I, 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 like that, but for it to mean something. You know, there are many people who can, in fact, say the word I, but it doesn't mean very much in their social context, because who, ca who cares about them? They're nobody. They don't matter. The one who matters is not just the one that society looks up to and, you know, circulates like a sign or something like that, 
but originally for Hegel, is the one who can say I and take responsibility for it and mean it because they are the one who threw the I onto the table and said, you can take that away. I'm willing to risk that I being destroyed just so that I can get to what I need because I have a curiosity about, about being that goes all the way to the point of death. So we have the two self-consciousnesses here. We have no unity between them anymore. Um, what we're going to have is a power relation instead of a unity. We're not going to have a reciprocity. So he says um, there, there's a, a consciousness which is not purely for itself, but who's it for? For another. What other? Well, this other right here, right? It's not just for another self-consciousness of this type. As a matter of fact, that wouldn't even make sense. You can't have just an entire... Uh, race or class or society or whatever you know sort of grouping we have uh, where it's all just consciousnesses that are that are purely for another or even just partly uh, for another where they aren't for themselves at the same time um, you need something in there as as human to set the agenda to decide what's going to happen to uh, you know, have the experiences that this group doesn't have. So he goes on and he says, uh, both moments are essential. You, you can't have the one without the other. See, that's where it gets really interesting. Aristotle said, and we're going to come back to this later on because we're talking about the classic conception of, of master and slave or, or lord and bondsman. Um, Aristotle said that the master exists as an independent being on his or her own. The slave is not an independent being on his or her own, but in a certain sense is for or has its purpose in the master. What Hegel's going to get at, why this, the master-slave dialectic has the sort of surprise ending that it does towards the end, is that the master can't be a master without having some slaves. And it's not just having people to boss around, you know, or to hold you up on some sort of litter. It's rather that you cannot be a master in any sort of meaningful sense unless you have another who can recognize you. All of those things are really less about, you know, expropriating what I want from the other and more about recognition deep down inside. So both of them are essential, but we don't, again, have a unity between them. It says, to begin with, they are unequal and opposed. Their reflection into unity has not yet been achieved. It's not going to be achieved, by the way, until after this section. They exist as two opposed shapes of consciousness. Opposed. This is not a, a, a harmonious, reciprocal relationship. This is not even a relationship in which the slaves are particularly happy about being slaves and accept their lot. They are going to be opposed to each other. We're going to see what, what sort of cruelty, uh, but which cruelty which is going to bear great, great effects for the development of, of human society, is necessary to keep this, this uh, position, this negative position on the side of the slave, enforced. So he says... One is the independent consciousness whose essential nature is to be for itself. It recognizes itself, you might say. It is able to say, I want. I am the I. I am the essential being. I am for myself. And masters as a group can do this with each other. There can be mutual recognition among them. They may have rivalries. They may have, you know, client relations. Things can get very complicated after that. But we can, you know, keep it simple at this point. We have, a, we have an independent self-consciousness over here whose essential nature is to be for itself. The other, he says, is the dependent consciousness whose essential nature. Now notice the term that he uses here. He doesn't just say it is to be for another. It's to live or to be for another. Why, why live? Because it valued its life more than it should have. It valued its determinacy, its independent, single existence, 
and not something greater than itself, that it was ready to lay itself down to try to win. The, the one over here loses, in effect, by wanting to live too much. And it doesn't get to live in the process. To really live ends up being on this side. They're the ones who, you know, have the good life, who, who you know, get to say, wow, we're really living now. And the ones over here who, who try to save their life actually end up, not so much losing it, but um, not in one single point, but rather are, are going to sacrifice it in stages. They're going to ebb it away bit by bit by bit, serving the other person. And so we arrive at the point where we now have these two identifiable terms. I don't really care myself whether you call this a slave or a servant or a bondsman or, you know, what, whatever you want. Uh, I mean, the German term is connect. Um, you know, it, it connotes this, this inferiority, this just being there to, to serve. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways this could be expressed. The basic idea is that this is dependent consciousness, that it is inessential, that it exists for another, that it has its value in what it does for another and in the eyes of the other. Again, I don't care what you want to call the one over here. You can call them a master. You can call them a lord. Uh, you can call them, you know, we can change the language. And instead of being hair, it could be dominus or whatever we like. It's the function that really matters. And it's the transformation of self-consciousness by existing in that function. Being in the master position means that self-consciousness is going to experience things differently than being in the slave position. Here's where it gets really interesting, and this is the foreshadowing. Which of them really is going to be the essential consciousness? Is it, as it looks here, the master? Is it that the master really has the handle on everything? Or will it turn out to be the slave? 